So now I would like to introduce Dr. Ralph Raddick to you. Dr. Raddick is a professor of psychology and the vice dean of education and social sciences at the University of Wuppertal in Germany. He is also a former associate professor of cognitive and developmental psychology at Florida State University. And in fact, he continues to work quite closely in partnership with the Florida Center for Reading Research on various projects related to reading development. Dr. Raddick is one of the world's leading experts on the use of eye movement analyses as a means to study information processing in reading. In addition to uh, researching reading development and information processing, he is also working on additional reading related research topics with practical implications. So at this time, I am going to turn the controls over to Dr. Raddick, and there will be just a few moments of transition on your screen as I do this. Thank you very much for the uh, very kind introduction. This is a unique a situation for me because I'm doing this for the very first time. Also, I'm all by myself in this closed down university. The, the security guard was just here to make sure I'm not some thief. Uh, because it's after nine o'clock in the evening, um, uh, but it's nice and cozy, and uh, I hope we will all have an interesting hour doing this web webinar. Um, the problem is going to be that it might be too much. So I have spent the last half hour deleting slides, but I still have too many. Uh, also, what's very unusual for me is I give talks all the time, but there's always a live audience. So what I usually do is I take a few faces in the audience to see whether people are following, you know, the content and and uh, the attention like goes down, rises, and and uh, maybe goes away at places. So this is all missing now, but uh, we will make the best out of it. So let's start. Um, I have coined this uh, talk or webinar, New Evidence on Silent versus Oral Reading. Of course, since we have only like 45 or 50 minutes before answering some questions, I will only be able to touch upon a few points in this uh, on this very complex topic. Um, but I also thought in order to get you involved, to give you a flavor of what the kind of thinking is that I'm uh, that I'm doing this with, where I'm coming from, where I'm going, I also need a little bit of introduction. So this introduction will comprise two points. One is um, a little bit of an idea of what the information processing view of reading is, uh, how it compares to other views. Uh, then the question, how do we best measure information processing and in reading? And obviously I will be advocating eye movement methodology to do that. I will then have a very quick look at reading development for like five minutes to just give you like more examples, more like practical hands-on examples of of how we do this work in the in the eye tracking research, and then um, a larger part will focus on one particular study, a developmental perspective on oral versus silent reading. Um, I had in my abstract. I had offered like more studies, more perspectives, but I realized this is all going to be too much because I'm in favor of better covering less content more deeply than you know all the content in a, in a more superficial way. So let's start out here. Um, with some simplification, one can say that currently there's two different uh, collaborating but also kind of coexisting streams of research and reading. One, one of these will be more familiar to you, and, and I'm calling this the psychometric reading research approach. It's rooted in education science, uh, and the goal here is to classify readers and predict the performance, right? Uh, examples are concepts like phonological awareness, where you have diagnostic measures uh, with various tasks, and they're taken to measure component skills of reading. Uh, this is extremely successful, but the problem with this kind of research is that it's basically correlational and the validity of measures is often questionable, sometimes questionable. So it's not clear how 
this, like a measure of phonological awareness, is related to the moment of moment to moment operation of information processing as reading is happening in real time. Now this is what experimental re reading research is interested in. So the goal here is to understand reading from an information processing perspective, similar to kind of understanding how motion picture viewing works or how visual search works or how problem solving works, right? So this is one, reading is one domain among others um, in the concert of cognitive science. The main methodology here is experimental and also the building of quantitative models. Uh, usually or so far in this stream of research, in individual differences were neglected uh, with little impact on education and practice. But this is now changing. Experimental reading research are getting much more interested in uh, practical application and individual differences. So the gap between the two perspectives is, is narrowing uh, more and more uh, year by year. And uh, so this is kind of also my, my approach to try and bridge the gap between these uh, two traditionally kind of more or less coexisting or competing uh, approaches. Now, if we look at this information processing view of reading, Obviously, uh, what's happening in reading is there's linguistic processing, right? So you have the acquisition of visually coded linguistic information, like visual features and letters, and they form letter clusters, they make up words and sentences and stuff. So on the basis of that, what you do is you construct a cognitive text representation. For example, we now talk about situation models, right? So the text on the page in your head turns into a situation model, a mental model, an internally constructed model of the outside world or of a chain of events as it is described in the text. That's linguistic processing. At the same time, real reading behavior uh, also includes visual motor processing. Visual motor processing is not some add-on. It's like part and parcel of reading itself, right? And that is concerning the targeting, timing, and sequence of saccadic eye movements. So what you do, basically, is you make eye movements, which you've all probably observed. Uh, just, you know, look your husband or boyfriend, you know, deep in the eye and observe the, their eye movements tonight. You will see that there is an eye movement like every three or four times a second. So these eye movements, and I'll, I will show you plenty of examples in just a few minutes. Uh, the point is that the eye movements serve to provide adequate conditions for the extraction of text information. So the window within which we can see letters clearly is very limited. It's, it's about when you fixate a certain letter, so when your eyes is, is fixed on a certain position within text, there's an area that spans around minus four letters up to like eight or ten letters. Minus means to the left, plus means to the right. So you go like minus four letters, all the way up to, as a maximum, eight to 10 letters to the right. And that is a region that we call the perceptual span. That's the span within which an adult skilled reader can recognize, can distinguish letters, okay? If you do this with children, you will see that the span is more limited, but it's still, it's still asymmetric, right? There's like minus three um, up to like, when you go to the right, up to like six letters for like a fifth grader. Um, so there is a limited area within which we can see the linguistic information. And in order to overcome that deficit, we have to move the eyes all the time. Now, in a cognitive science-based reading research approach, we have a number of basic questions that we are trying to address. For example, we need to specify both streams of processing in detail, we need to understand like the intricate mechanics that are at play here. We need to understand the dynamic interplay. And what we do is we build dynamic mathematical models of this process. So basically these are algorithms that try to simulate the process of reading as it is happening in real time. And as I already mentioned, we are now in the process of extending those ideas and models towards capturing individual differences and developing we are now looking into non-Roman writing systems. We look into dyslexia and all kinds of interesting applications, uh, including, for example, I have a project on speed reading right now. And um, one major, major arena of this research is now the application in 
um, educational settings. All right, so this looks a little scary, uh, maybe at first sight, but and it's also kind of a little arbitrary. It's uh, this is like our household model or a household sketch of levels of word processing and reading. Um, I'm showing this to you just to give you an idea of the way we think about reading uh, within this cognitive-based um, research field. I will not have the time to explain all these different boxes because if I take like five minutes, uh, all my time will be basically spent if I take five minutes for each box. But when you look at this, you will realize that this chain of modules and or operations and processes goes from basic stuff down here, visual processing, like um, here on the right hand side, it's fine detail, that's like letter features, right? On the left hand side, it's more coarse stuff like word spaces or word shape. That then goes into this module here that we call graphematic processing. This is where the letters get their identity. This is where I realize, oh, this is not just an assembly of visual features, it's an A. Also at that, uh, at that level, we, we lose sight of the specific visual um, construction, um, the visual uh, content of this letter. And the letter becomes like an abstract identity. It becomes orthographic. Okay? All that's left is the information that there was an A. On the right hand side here we have phonological processing. Phonological processing in silent reading, that's, that's a model of silent reading by the way. Um, all you see on this page is just concerned with silent reading. But even in silent reading, phonological processing happens all the time. There's like three or four different places in silent reading word recognition where we see traces, massive traces of phonological processing that's happening all the time in silent reading. Okay? And then orthographic processing, orthographic processing, the formation of letter clusters, like statistics of co-occurrence of letters forms letter clusters, and sound combinations, they kind of team up to um, form the input for the next level, uh, which is lexical processing, access to the lexicon. The lexicon is the part in your memory where you store the words, whereas semantic memory is the part in the memory where you store the concepts that are behind the words. Okay, So words and concepts are not the same. Uh, these are two different levels. Um, and here on the left hand side I have made a little sketch um, of some arrows that are just you know, intended to remind you that, that there's also this other more dynamic side of reading to which we will come in a few seconds. And here on the right hand side I have put um, arrows towards articulation, reading aloud, and the I voice spend. Now if you think about it, if, if this is a simple sketch of a model that encompasses the levels and modules that you need for silent word recognition in the context of skilled reading, then of course the question arises, what is added to that when you do your reading orally? The simplest idea would be that you get like kind of a simple conversion from your orthographic units, right, that get like um, more and more like, like part by part converted into phonemes, right? So you would like draw, you would like draw an, an arrow from this level, you know, to another model that would be uh, dealing with language production, okay? Capturing reading aloud. Uh, but it's not so simple. Because, for example, when we, when we read aloud, when I read aloud, I make semantic errors. So what comes out when I read aloud is sometimes not the concept that I had intended, okay, depending on the context. And sometimes it's not the word that I had intended, depending on other factors like word frequency, predictability, and so on. So the relationship between the information processing in silent reading and the production component, the sounding out of, of the words as it is happening, right, in reading aloud is not so clear. And that is the, that is a new area of research that we are just kind of mapping out, slowly, slowly getting into. All right, um, one example to show you that these, these 
boxes here, the boxes and the earth, they really have psychological or, if you want, educational reality. So how can I show this to you? I can show this to you um, by convincing you that behind this is also a kind of hardware. On the one hand, there's lots and lots of, of experimental evidence. On the other hand, there's hardware. So what do I mean by hardware? For example, if we consider a patient that has an impairment, okay, that has a lesion to this specific unit here, the graphemic processing uh, unit, if we look into the brain, that should, yeah, here we go, if you look into the brain, there is a specific area, okay, a specific region in the left inferior temporal cortex, right, right here where it says graphemes, okay, um, and that's called the visual waveform area. So if that area is damaged, what you get is um, a, uh, a kind of a very, very severe reading impairment that we refer to as letter by letter reading, okay? So this piece of hardware in the brain breaks down, as you see on the, on the right-hand side, there is a, a widespread lesion in this one patient that encompasses the visual waveform area. Right? And the result is letter by letter reading. This patient is no longer able to form letter clusters, to put letters together according to the, to the metrics of the co-occurrence of letters. So we know that some letters happen to, to be together all the time and that, you know, uh, that, that makes them form a word. And these computations are no longer possible because this one unit in our little model uh, is not working anymore. So these, these units, these modules of information processing, they all have their reality and the evidence that we have for that comes from experimental studies, lots and lots of experiments, but it also comes from these uh, case studies with interesting patients. All right, now Let's get to the second point. How do we best measure information processing and reading? Um, I'm obviously an advocate of uh, doing this with eye movements, but there's also other very, very good methodologies. Of, uh, for example, here uh, at our university, we, all, we also have an EG lab where, the, um, where we do measurements from, from the scalp of the electrical uh, activity in the brain and there is now lots and lots of uh, research where uh, the uh, new imaging technologies are used to kind of look into the brain as the metabolism is happening there. What's unique about eye movement measurement is, as I said before, the eye movements are part and parcel of the process itself. There's, there's nothing artificial about it. You do them as part of reading. So you're kind of basically uh, observing the mind as it does the task of reading. So, um, a little bit of, tech of uh, methodology here. Um, we make eye movements from a certain position to another position. Uh, these positions are these, these snapshots, the, the points of, of relative uh, stability where the eyes are not moving are called fixations. They have a duration between Round about, here is the distribution, round about uh, 100 to 500 with peaks around like 200, 250 and so forth. Um, the movements themselves are called saccades. Uh, here, for example, you go from this position to that position. That's the launch side. That's the landing position. Okay. And as you, as you will predict, in reading, most of those movements go from left to right, but there's also a few movements that go from right to left. Okay, um, this, um, w this is a picture from a lab where I was working as a visiting student in 1990, 1991. Uh, you see the equipment is kind of cumbersome and the uh, reading situation is a little bit artificial and, and inconvenient, but this has changed over the years. This was the situation in 2005, right? Uh, the problem here was that the equipment, that's, that's a camera, uh, that's another camera, that the equipment was uh, sitting on the head and after like 20 minutes of, you know, wearing this headgear, the kids got really tired and, and uneasy. So this is the latest incarnation of, uh, the, uh, of, of a good measurement situation. And uh, 
These days you can also do it in this way. And I would claim that this reading situation is not so far removed from uh, a normal situation of reading from a computer screen. And within a few years, this equipment will kind of, will really be like m minimized, and it will it will be barely visible. It it can be hidden in the screen or something. We will we will see this technical development uh, within the next decade. All right. So we have the setup right here. Here's the recording system. You see, um, there is several. Well, the way it works is that uh, an infrared beam of light is sent onto the eyes. There are several reflections on the eyes, on the various surfaces on the eyes. And these reflections that are captured by a video camera, they serve um, to give us the necessary information to determine eye movements and fixation positions with very high precision. We do this with letter level accuracy and with millisecond timing accuracy. So I can tell you how many milliseconds you spent on a specific letter fixating while you were reading. Okay. Now, how are language processing and eye movements related? This is very important to understand everything that comes later, right? The first point is eye movement control is word-based. There's a strong tendency to send the eye to, the, to a specific word. The eyes always want to go to a specific word. How do we know this? This is um, this is probably a figure that I show in almost every talk I'm giving. Um, this is the distribution, um, a frequency distribution of where the eye land, where the eyes land within a word. So this is kind of a longish word, like ten letters, right? You come from the left and you move into a word. So where do you land? Okay. So on average, what happens is that very few eye movements land on the empty space between the words, okay? Then you have a few landing on the first letter, the second letter, the third letter, okay? So there is a clustering, there is a tendency to go to a specific target location. Now this is one subject, look look at this reader, okay? It's different. In this reader, uh, there's a strong tendency to go to the word center. And then still we see a different picture in this person, we see it slightly differently here, okay? There's one uh, where the distribution is much more spread out, but the point is that everybody has an individual distribution. Okay, every s reader has this tendency to go to select single words as the target for the next eye movement. Now, this is not this is not perfect, right? So uh, this concept down here is the eye mind span. This means that there is no perfect correspondence between. Um, what we look at and what we process, okay? Uh, for example, there's paraphobia processing, so we acquire information not only from the word we're fixating, but also from the word that's like one position to the right or even two positions to the right, and sometimes we even may acquire information from positions that are left of our current fixation. Okay, so there's a pretty tight relationship between where the eyes are and what is being processed, but that relationship is not Perfect. Now I can switch over to my, I thought I can switch over easily to my little, ah, there we go. That's a little demonstration. Okay. So this boy is going to read aloud. I hope you can hear that. Uh, it's going to take a few seconds to stabilize on my screen. Okay. Okay. So the two subjects are actually brothers. Here's the second brother. Okay. All right. Going back to the main presentation. Um, now, 
what you have seen now was a live recording of two boys doing reading aloud while their eye movements were being tracked. Um, and we can zoom into this a little bit. This, I only have a German example, but it's going to work. Um, so this is going to show typical eye movements, right? This is like, um, we have actually taken this from a child. That, that's like an elementary school student's reading. Um, so there's a complicated work, word here, okay, that I can't even translate this so easily. This is like cork fabric, okay? And the child probably sees this for the first time, right? There's like two fixations, three fixations, four, five, six, seven. So as you see, there's a lot of mental work going on on this uh, newly acquired word or infrequent word, and we can actually see how the mind does that. Okay, so the great thing about this methodology is that we can actually observe the mind doing the mental work. So look at this here, same word. So we've put in the same word twice, and what you've just seen is a case of verbal learning. All right, so you have, you have all these extra fixations, all these different goes or passes over the word, and here this is already reduced to only four fixations, right? So this was, uh, this was an observation. Uh, of learning a word as you went uh, in reading. Okay, now a last remark on methodology before we get to some data. Um, so what do we do with all these eye movements now? Um, we need to find a way to analyze them in a meaningful way. And the way we do this is uh, we take these thousands of movements and we put them in different categories. Okay, one category is what we call the initial fixations. And specifically here we're looking at the durations of those initial fixations. So how long does it take for the eyes to move again? How long do they have to pause to process the information that is there? Okay, and this shows for a second grader, okay, um, the duration of that initial fixation uh, as a function of word length from one to eight. Okay, there's there's not much going on here. Um, the action is much more in this second slice of the pie, and that is what we call refixation durations. That is time spent uh, immediately refixating the same word. Okay, so you make an additional fixation on the same word before you leave it. And the third slice of the pie here, that's what we re refer to as rereading. This is leaving the word and then coming back a few moments later to re-inspect it, to re-analyze it, okay? And we attribute certain stages in processing to these three slices of the pie. Initial fixation duration is thought to be related to initial orthographic and early lexical processing, word level processing. Refixation duration is assumed to be related to processing up to lexical access, finding the word in the lexicon. And this rereading time um, slice of the pie is uh, thought to include higher level processing, higher level processing on the sentence and text level. Okay, so we have these different measures that are related to different stages in the uh, information processing as it is happening in skilled reading. Okay, a quick look at reading development. Uh, we're at half past, so we're doing okay on time. Um, First of all, there is a surprisingly little number of studies using eye movements with children. I mean, there, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of papers doing this with adult skilled readers, but using eye tracking with children is still a pretty underdeveloped area. Um, however, there has been a few pioneering studies as early uh, as 1922, um, but these were restricted to global parameters, like mean fixation duration. Like for example here, you see mean fixation duration. This is Buswell, this is Taylor, Reading Plus, Taylor family. Then we've got Rayner here, Keith Rayner, George McConkie, very important names in the eye movement research community. And it's um, very clear that when, when you measure this mean fixation duration, when you take this mean fixation duration measure, what you get is you get a decrease in the mean fixation duration. And the conclusion from that is very straightforward. 
Central processing speed increases and reading uh, specific component skills develop. So basically, lexical processing is getting more and more efficient, and that is then showing up in these overall eye movement measures. We are now, in our um, current research, we are now going a step further. And that step further means we're now looking at word-specific parameters, just like the ones that I have just introduced with my first fixation duration, refixation duration, and rereading time. And here's an example for this. I can spare you the details. Just let's have a look at these uh, sentences. So we do these sentence reading experiments all the time. For example, the second sentence here, Linda looked for her little brother just to play with him. Okay, so rather in this sentence is a specific target word. Okay, so a target word can be short, can be long, can be frequent, can be infrequent. Okay, frequency is measured by the overall occurrence, the frequency of occurrence of this word in a in one million words of English text or French or German text, whatever language you work with, okay, that's your word frequency. And word frequency is, is taken as a proximity measure, as a proxy for the mental effort necessary to get to lexical access. Simplifying, right? It's, it, it's more complicated than that, but we can, uh, we can keep a long story short by just saying word frequency is related, is correlated, is, is correlated uh, to lexical access, finding a word in the lexicon. So here's our control target word, right? We also control the pre-target word, that's always an adjective, and we also do some control on the post-target word. So all these sentences now can be e easily and nicely compared, okay? For example, in this experiment we had like, I don't know, 180, 190 sentences. So that gives you a lot of statistical power, and you can now do all kinds of interesting uh, computations with the results. Uh, he, here's an example for, for comprehension questions that we ask. And this is good uh, to show now because the exact same methodology will be applied uh, uh, or has been applied to collect the data that I will show in a few minutes on the oral and silent stuff. Um, okay, so where was I? Uh, the comprehension questions. Half of them target simple semantic relations, just like who does it, or what's the object, what's the location, and half of the comprehension questions would complex, would target complex semantic relations, for example, causality, why is Linda in the garden, so that readers, uh, in this case elementary school students, are really, are really forced, are really uh, asked to read on like a literal level and on a, on a deep reading for meaning level, right? On a surface structure level and on a deep structure level. Okay, deep meaning level. All right, again as a reminder I think that 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 information about uh, these three slices of the pie should still be present and what we do uh, with these three slices is we put them together in one case, we put the initial fixation and the refixation, so this stuff here, this slice of the pie, and this yellow portion here is put together and called gaze duration. Gaze duration is the initial fixation plus the refixation. So that's basically the time you spend on a word before you leave it. And total viewing time is the total time you ever spend on a word, okay? So that's gaze duration, these things, plus the rereading time, the time I spend coming back. So. Why am I repeating this? Because I need it to explain this graph here. And this is the only graph I'm going to show from this study. Um, and let's focus on this particular part of the graph. Okay? So this is long words, low frequency. So this is the really um, this is the really difficult words. And if if you compare fixation duration, gaze duration, and total viewing time you see that by far the largest difference between second graders and fourth graders is with total viewing time. So what does that mean? That means that a lot of, of the developmental work that, or the developmental difference that, that we observe when we compare the, 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 the typical second grader with the typical fourth grader 
happens post lexical. It's in these higher order processes. It's in the rereading part, right? Because that's what makes the difference here. So this post lexical stuff, the higher order, the comprehension related things, the sentence level analysis, or even the text level analysis, that is what makes a huge difference um, between second grade and fourth grade, in addition to all the other abilities. And I'm showing this here uh, because uh, this comprehension part, this high level processing part, uh, has been neglected to some extent, uh, especially in the American um, research and educational discussion arena over the last, say, two decades. And here you see one piece of evidence that that, uh, that should probably be uh, viewed in a more balanced way. All right, all on silent reading. Uh, we have like 10 more minutes left, so that's going to be plenty of time. Um, so, what do, what do we want to know from a, theoretical, from a theoretical point of view? Well, one question, uh, similar to what I said in my introduction, uh, should be, how does the addition of a language production component influence what's already going on, right, in information acquisition, in word recognition, and in comprehension? So how is that different, right? What, what, what does that added complexity mean? What does it do? From an educational point of view, of course, oral reading is, is, is the starting point of instruction. It's, it's, it's the benchmark in, in every reading curriculum. It's easy for teachers to track errors. And there's often this, 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 this assumption that is actually not so easy to test. It's, it's not so easy to kind of verify that all reading provides a valid and reliable ad hoc assessment of general reading ability. Okay? So many people believe, you know, on face validity that that's true, but it's going to require uh, research effort to verify or qualify that belief. All right. So uh, this. Uh, package of data that, that I, will, I will present over the next few minutes comes from a study that we are doing, um, not only we, the, that a team that includes our group is doing at Florida State University, at the Florida Center for Reading Research, under the leadership of, of my colleague Chris Lornigan. Um, and um, the overall goal of this, this very largely a project is, is, is goes way beyond the study. Um, the overarching goal of, of our slice within that complex uh, group of researchers is to apply our basic research methodology to identify underlying processes that contribute to comprehension. That's the overall goal. Okay? And in order to do that, we also have to understand the basic processes that are kind of coming before comprehension and are the building blocks uh, for the development of comprehension skills and for uh, even more sophisticated stuff like comprehension monitoring, uh, about which we also do um, research projects. Okay, so let's ask three pretty concrete questions. Um, Question one, what are the trajectories of reading development in oral compared to silent reading? Okay, so what are the performance, the efficiency differences in oral and silent reading over the course of development? Um, second question, do word frequency effects change? Remember, word frequency was our proxy, it was our approximation measure for the mental load uh, that is associated with processing a single word in the context of a sentence, right? So how is that changing over the course of reading development anyway? And is this change differentially elected by, affected by reading mode? Okay? And third question, are there systematic differences between good and poor comprehenders uh, when we look at silent versus oral reading? All right, this is the three questions. Um, one word on comprehension. Uh, I was really surprised when I looked into this literature and saw that it's actually not clear at all whether reading aloud 
enhances or hampers comprehension. Okay? One idea is that when you read aloud, you benefit from the additional auditive input when you're monitoring your own articulation. Just, so you're kind of listening to yourself again, and that gives you another, an extra stream of input. Okay? Um, so variants of that uh, would say, um, okay, there is an additional module, an additional layer of processing going on of the same content, and that gives you just more substance, more, um, more stuff that comprehension can work on. So it's good for comprehension. On the other hand, uh, there is a convincing, an equally convincing argument that says, okay, uh, when you have to do language production, in uh, addition to word recognition, sentence level uh, parsing and stuff like that, or even text level comprehension, um, you need extra resources for pronunciation, for intonation, for monitoring of speech errors, and that leaves less capacity for comprehension. Okay, so this is this is the opposite from from this opinion up here, obviously, and and it's simply impossible to decide which position is right on the basis of the existing literature. We simply don't know. Okay, so in this study we have a very large sample of children uh, that were tested with a, an, an extremely large, very impressive battery of reading tests, and then a subsample, as many as we could take, then went into the eye-tracking part of the project, so they all these children, 628, uh, we're probably now at over 700, but this is, uh, this is the sample that I can report on today. Over 600 children uh, spent round about three hours in the eye tracking lab doing various tasks. Uh, but today, I'm only going to give you a few um, results on the reading of sentences, 48 sentences very similarly constructed to the ones that you have seen a few minutes before. So basically it's, it's the same, it's very much the same kind of sentences. And 48 of these sentences were read silently and 48 of the sentences were read aloud. Now, the sample, as I said, included kids from uh, first grade to fifth grade. Um, and what's important here is that the sentences as I said, they were constructed in the same way as we've seen before, right? High frequency, low frequency, and so forth. But um, the important point to make is that the sentences were identical for the first graders, second graders, all the way up to fifth graders. So um, we did that in order to avoid the confound uh, that you get when you look at what's called grade appropriate reading materials, okay? Um, of course, you can argue that that's a problem, right? Uh, because the same sentence may not mean the same thing, may not pose the same challenge for a first grader as compared to a fifth grader. But our answer to that is yes, exactly. Because that's development. You, you give a child the exact same task, and you see how the mastery of that exact same task is changing over time, right? Um, but we are also in these other, um, here in the, in the paragraph reading, in this other part of the project, we are using age-appropriate materials, uh, so we're doing it both ways, okay? For good reasons, we're doing it both ways. Uh, there's problems associated with either approach, but today we are focusing on the sentences that are identical uh, for all grades. Okay, and I'm going to do this in three steps. First, a global analysis across all words. Then there's going to be an analysis that takes into account word frequency. And finally, there's going to be like two slides uh, that deal with comprehension in terms of good comprehenders, bad comprehenders. Okay? The global, an global analysis, very straightforward. Um, this is fixation probability, the probability, the frequency with which you even fixate words. Okay? And as you would expect, that goes down from first grade to fifth grade. We have a little glitch here, and we don't really know what that is, okay? But the overall tendency, of course, is clear. And what you see is there's a very large and reliable difference between silent 
are and allowed. So your frequency of fixating words is higher in reading allows you skipping less words. Okay, about uh, with adults, about a third of all words are not fixated, and that's what I just showed you for the kids. More interesting is the result for fixation duration. Okay, and what we can observe here is again this difference between silent and allowed. Okay, so for first grade, uh, you have a fixation duration of 350 milliseconds here, right? For fifth grade, that goes down to 280 roundabout. That's a very significant, very large effect, right? Um, but what's really interesting here is that that difference, okay, between oral and silent is not really changing all that much. Okay, that that is one very interesting point. And the other very interesting point is, so whatever makes the difference is not really changing, right? Um, but what I find especially interesting here is that when you look at the right side panel here, this is this shows the first of two fixations, and this shows the second of two fixations. Now, when you make two fixations on the word, right, during the second of the two fixations, it's very likely that something else is happening, okay? You do more advanced word processing um, in comparison to your first fixation duration, but no matter what that what that stage is, your relative stage within the process of, of like figuring out the meaning of that particular word, it doesn't make any difference, right? So the functional role of the fixation within the word is not relevant. That was surprising. Okay, next one. This is refixation time. This is the time you spend refixating, making immediate again, making immediate refixations, new fixations on the word before you leave, okay? Not much going on, but again, the difference kind of stays the same, okay? And here with the rereading time, this is the first, this is the first time um, where we're seeing something surprising, okay? This is the first time where something's kind of looking a little awkward, okay? Not counting this little glitch here, but this here at the beginning is looking a little awkward. Okay, so in first grade, there's actually more rereading in the oral mode. We are, we are suspecting that there is still articulation difficulty. These kids are still struggling with their basic articulation skills. Okay, so this may be responsible for the more massive rereading in oral mode, which also may be related to like uh, reading errors, reading difficulty, articulation difficulty on a on a very basic level uh, of um, oral processing, of articulation, of speech production, okay? The picture is, is beginning to change here, and it's, and it's massively different over there, right? So let's just keep in mind, because this is going to be coming back in a few minutes, uh, there's massive rereading, often several words, in those young readers, and there's more rereading, and that's really interesting. There's more rereading in the silent mode. Now, this is, isn't that awkward? Wouldn't you assume that in the mode, in the reading mode, that's obviously more difficult? In the reading mode, that is obviously more demanding, which you see here and which you have seen before in the other slides, right? Why would it be that there is less rereading? That's kind of a non trivial finding, okay? But we will get back to this in a few seconds. All right. More global analysis. Um, proportion of re that's not interesting. Uh, the proportion of regressions, that is similar to this graph here, the rereading time. Regression means the likelihood of going back, of making a movement to a word where it already was before. Okay, this is the likelihood of making a movement back to an area where I've been before. Again, we see the same shift here the same difference with, between the first graders and the other grades. This time is, is, is um, even more pronounced so that the change already occurs here at second grade. Okay, and there is, um, yeah, there's more increase in the word regression frequency. Okay, there is, so there is selective rereading, right? There is more 
there is more regressions again as it should be because it should it should correspond to this it should correspond to this figure okay there's more rereading as we observe there's more re regressions uh, in the silent reading mode okay this is again the paradoxical finding but this time seen from the perspective not of the time but the perspective of the movement okay all right this was our global a few snapshots from the global analysis across our target words. Let's now zoom in. Let's now focus on our target words, our well-controlled, linguistically very well-selected target words, uh, and look at word frequency effects. Okay? Now, this looks a little complicated, but it's not. Word frequency effects are attenuated in oral reading. This is what, what this basically, this is what this basically means. Okay? This is silent reading, this is reading aloud, and if you look at the high and low frequency difference, it's greatly attenuated uh, in oral reading. Okay, So in oral reading, that variant is kind of buried in, in other sources that cause these differences. Okay, Another way of looking at this is to say silent reading is more adaptive. It's, it's, it's better reflect, reflecting the fluctuations in the mental workload. Okay. Here we look at rereading time and again the proportion of regressions, okay, as a function of grade again, first grade, second grade, third grade, and silent and oral. And look at this. There is this 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 uh, large effect of word frequency in silent reading, okay, silent reading. Large effect of word frequency, large effect, large, 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 huge effect. It's almost disappearing in oral reading. Okay, so this rereading time uh, shows it best, and the proportion of regressions again, it's the same thing. The effect is almost disappearing. All right. Finally, a few minutes left only. Uh, we get to comprehension. Okay, and what we did here is we were partitioning the sample into good versus weaker comprehenders based on the responses on, of the comprehension questions. Okay, and this is like the second, I think there's like two more slides. Um, and what we find is, again, this is reading mode, silent, oral, uh, the grades again. Okay, and we find longer total times for poorer comprehenders, well, that's trivial. Okay, that's, they are poor comprehenders, after all, less successful readers. Okay, poor and good. All right, there's this difference here. Um, and it, but it's also clear it's also clear that poor comprehenders in first grade, first grade, they have massive problems with oral reading. Okay, so there's the silent aloud difference here. Okay, but if if we look at the older grades, right, or you, you could say, if, if you turn this around, very young kids will have massive problems in oral reading. Uh, who have massive problems in oral reading? They comprehend less text. Okay? So this is this interesting interaction here. Okay? And if, if we look at the older grade, um, this also makes perfect sense. You've got the good comprehenders and the poor comprehenders, and there is the difference in silent reading and reading aloud, but where it really gets this interesting interaction uh, is in the young readers. Okay, I'm afraid we can also uh, we can also now cross this with the frequency effect, but I, I just want to say that the frequency effect is more pronounced for good comprehenders, but only when they read silently. Okay, when they read aloud, that is again like buried away um, in the other sources of variance. So discussion, I uh, can skip that because that only says that things are developing, right? But uh, remember again this increase in the proportion of the interword regressions, okay? So that's selectively checking back to words that they have already looked at for comprehension, okay? So the primary driving force of, of development is probably the more automatic low-level processing and decoding and also the efficiency of lexical processing. Okay. Um, when we now compare silent and aloud, uh, what is interesting is the overall slowing of processing speed 
Um, remember, we saw that in the fixation durations, no matter what fixations they were, first of two or second of two, and so there seems to be an increased overall demand, a cognitive demand of the other processes. What are these other processes? Speech planning, articulation monitoring, eye voice coordination. So this stuff comes on top and it takes its toll from every single fixation that we measure in oral reading. Okay? Also, this really paradoxical, very interesting finding of a lower proportion of inward regressions. Where does that come from? Well, we believe it's imposed by what we call eye voice constraints. Okay? Um, in reading, uh, we observe, and we've done this in a separate chain of experiments, we observe that the eyes are usually ahead of the voice in adults uh, by about 500 milliseconds and in children by about 800 milliseconds. Okay? And it's, it's like it's like a rubber band connection. The eyes are kind of slightly ahead, and sometimes you can even see how they have to wait for the voice to catch up. Because if the distance between the eyes and the voice is getting too large, what's the consequence? Well, the consequence is that since you have to store all that content in working memory, your working memory gets an overflow. So you kind of have to pause. Uh, to overcome this extra mental effort uh, due to the overload in working memory. So these eye voice constraints are a very uh, important source of, of extra complexity, of extra effort in oral reading that in most research has so far been completely overlooked. Okay, word frequency effects are greatly attenuated in uh, reading aloud. There's almost no effect of frequency on the regression rate. We've seen that. And finally, we saw that there is, well, that's, that's to be expected. There's longer, longer total reading times, total word processing times for poor comprehenders. In first grade, it's more pronounced than reading aloud. Um, the frequency effect is more pronounced for the good readers. What does that mean? Well, it means, it's quite straightforward. It means that poor comprehenders apparently lack the flexibility to allocate their processing time to more difficult words when that is needed. Okay? So poor comprehenders are less flexible. Even when it gets to more basic processes, they're less flexible in allocating their processing resources. And that may even be a source of becoming or being a poor comprehender. Okay, this is it. Um, things I had no time to talk about. Well, I had no real time to talk about paraphobia processing and oral reading. Well, basically, the take-home message is it's it's limited. There is less. You take in more. You take in much less information from the words surrounding the one that you're fixating. Okay, so there's much less parallel processing. And also, I did not really have time to go into eye voice coordination. Very very interesting topic. But at least I could alert you to the fact that this I voice coordination problem even exists. And we are in the process of trying to find out whether it's more pronounced for less skilled or less good readers and uh, more poor comprehenders. Um, other interesting topics that are directly related and that we have addressed or that we are addressing uh, in other projects is visual skills for reading, comprehension, and comprehension monitoring. Um, but that is probably going to be uh, topics for the next and or second next webinar.